funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television license fee. Before modern farm machinery and mechanisation changed farming forever, especially from the mid 20th century onwards. Farm labours were the backbone of the Irish agricultural economy. To find out more, I recently met up with South County Kildare farmer Colin Flynn, as he was harvesting his wheat crop in his modern New Holland combine harvester. What we're at the, at the moment is harvesting winter wheat. When people want to know where their flour for their bread comes from, what you're looking at here is a field of wheat. It will be harvested by the machine here, the grain will be separated out, it will be brought to the store and tested and subject to those tests. It will be deemed as to whether it's human consumption quality and if so it will more than likely end up in your whole grain bread at some point in the future. Now you were telling me Colm that in past years, in the days of the, the former farm labourers, it was it was very different, not as machine intensive. I mean how many people would have been doing the job that you're doing now here with the combine and everything? What I am doing today, I have replaced something in the region of about 25 people. Up to the 1950s, farming in Ireland depended on horsepower and also large numbers of physically tough farm labourers to get the farm work done. John Dorney, social commentator and historian. The general picture is that the farmers need a lot of labour before mechanisation. You know, they need a lot of spade work, a lot of muscle work uh, to bring in crops. And also, you know, for things like uh, sheep shearing and stuff like that. But especially for, for tillage farming, you need an, an awful lot of, of manpower and woman power. Everything was basically being done by hand. You had permanent labour on the farm and you had casual labourers that came in for different peak times during the year, whether that was hone beet, hone turnips shearing sheep. Harvest time at the time would have been all grain would have had to be cut and stuck with uh, binders. That grain then would have had to be put up in ricks in the f- sometime then in the spring of the year then a steam engine would come along with a trashing mill trashing set. Colm Flynn. Here's former travelling farm labourer John Dwyer. Every farm in Ireland had a man employed. Some had three men. There was farms had six men. Both single and married people brought up big families, farm labourers. And they worked hard seven days a week. And even Christmas. They'd have a few hours all right, but they'd do the... The, be- the necessary jobs Christmas morning, the milking of the few cows, feeding them, and then go down home, and then come back up later on in the evening, and see that everything is all right. And these people shouldn't be forgotten. They work for small wages. A lot of these little cottages hadn't run in water, hadn't toilets, no electricity, and... They made the best of life. What is clear from prior comments is that farm labours were vital to the health and well-being of the Irish agricultural economy of yesteryear, pre-1950s. They were as essential to Irish farming as oil and electricity are to our modern world. Without them, the people in towns and cities throughout Ireland would have gone hungry and the Irish economy would have collapsed. This is their story, the story of the forgotten farm labourers of yesteryear. The farm labourers, the backbone of the Irish economy. These were the people who sweated and toiled in the fields of Ireland over centuries. They were the backbone of the operation, really. Like, it was all based on labour. If you didn't have labour, you know, you had nothing. You needed help. There was no machinery. Back then, a lot more work, a lot more labour intensive. It was heavy work. It was heavy work. Men they were physically fit that thing. It was through the farm labour that the people in the towns and cities were fed. Without his manual labour input, the people in the towns and cities would have starved. When it comes down to it, these are the people who, who produced the food and who produced the wealth. And had it not been for them, the place couldn't have functioned for, for all those centuries. By 
the last quarter of the 19th century, farm labourers in Ireland could be divided into two distinct categories. First, those with usually an acre or less who lived in a cottage near a large farmer or estate, and who they worked for on a permanent basis. Or second, those casual labourers who offered their services to farmers, whether for a specific job or seasonal work. Now, the so-called spalping or travelling farm labourers were part of this group. To explain further, here's a story in Austin O'Sullivan of the Irish Agricultural Museum, situated in Johnstown Castle Estate, County Wexford. Well, you see, if a man had any substantial area of land, he couldn't work it on his own. And a lot of the work, of course, was fairly straightforward, repetitive, physical. And so, if he didn't have his own family members, he had to go out and hire in help. And as was touched on already, from the 1880s onwards, much of this help came from either the labourer with an acre or less of land, or the travelling labourer. Historian Mario Corrigan of Kildare Library Services. With the great changes in land ownership, most people were, if they were lucky enough to be able to buy in their own little plot that they had been working on that were part of the great estates. But, I mean, they weren't enough to keep you, to, to, to supply you or to keep you in goods and in, in money. So uh, most of these guys were attached to the bigger, stronger farmers and they, they would have had their own little plot maybe, but they were permanent labourers on the bigger farm. And then, of course, you had the travelling, well, the old spalpeen, as you called them. I mean, the, the travelling. Travelling labourer. And we'll talk more about the tradition of the travelling farm labourer shortly. But staying for the moment with those labourers who worked either full time or part time for farmers, here's what farmer Colin Flynn had to say about the size of his family's farm in the 1920s, as well as how many labourers would have been employed on it. Well, at that time, the farm would have run to about 230 acres, right? Still the same, we didn't sell off very little, you know, we didn't, it didn't increase or get any smaller, you know. You would have had three full-time employees, right, working six days a week. On top of that then, the other labourers and support would have come in for, as I said, the shearing, the trashing, so the beet, the pulling of beet, tinning of turnips, that would have ran to at least another four or five seasonal workers. So if you put them, there will be about four to four months of seasonal work in any 12. So for that length of time, you had all these extra work. But you had wives, children. You know, it wasn't just the men that worked the land. Women worked the land, the children worked the land. You know, whether the, the small kids would have done things like tinning beet, tinning turnips, all that small, handy sort of stuff. Uh, rolling fleeces of wool when the shearing would be on. That kind of stuff was, uh, uh, at the women would have been involved in trashing, maybe building the ricks, different things like that. The potatoes later on. Potatoes, all that sort of carry on, yeah, absolutely. And what was occurring on the Flynn family farm would have been the story for the majority of large farms throughout Ireland in the first half of the 20th century. Every large farm employed a sizable number of people. So what was the daily routine for most farm labourers? former farm labourer Mick O'Brien, who used to work on the O'Brien family farm in Old Court, County Wexford. Now, the farm at that time, you went in in the morning at 8 o'clock, right? Now, there was 7 to 10 cows milking. You got your breakfast, first thing, and you went out in the yard. Now, these were tied in with chains around the neck that time, and there was a channel behind them. You cleaned out the dung, then you got a three-legged stool and you sat down and you milked the cows, right? Now there was cattle, fat cattle of bean. You'd have to feed them. Then you'd have to do a bit of work behind them, clean them out. And then you have to bring them down the hay and straw and bed them. And then you were out to the field. Now, the field consists of, it could be the time for pulling the turnips. It could be the time for pulling the mangle. It could be the time for tinning the beet. Or, that's your day's work, right? So, 12 o'clock, you come back in dinner, and uh, you got an hour for your dinner, and then back out to the fields again. In the winter evenings, in the winter evenings now, you were brought back at 4 o'clock, back in out of the field at 4 o'clock. The same story as in the morning, 
the cows had to be milked, the cattle had to be fed, and there was pigs, and every animal could be mentioned was in the farmer's place, that thing. And all them had to be done, but you had all done by six o'clock. And you got your supper at six o'clock, and I had a push bike, I think, and rode the push bike a mile home, and oftentimes we stayed and had a game of drafts after the day's work, you know. And that was usually the run of the of the farming. Now, the summertime would come then, the harvest, it was the same routine. The cattle would be out at this stage, and the cows would be, have to be brought in, all right. They'd be all out on grass. There wouldn't be any cleaning on the houses then, but there'd be the cutting of the corn, and there'd be the drawing in of the corn. That all happened in that time. There was no such thing as combines or tractors. On the big estates, they would be seeking to hold on to their workers virtually 12 months of the year because workers were cheap, were cheap labour because they didn't have high aspirations and they were paid as much in kind as in money. Austin O'Sullivan of the Irish Agriculture Museum, situated in Johnstown Castle Estate. Like the good estate would have cottages built on site and the family would live there and even live right out to their debt and maybe be replaced by their upcoming generation and they would have entitlements to the likes of milk and firewood this was the regular case here in Johnstown Castle and it was widely across the country too so those people were relatively secure but there were many other estates which were, were not so well organised, of course, and maybe where the management wasn't so good. And they tried to get by on a much smaller number of permanent staff, and then they'd look to temporary staff. And these could be, uh, say, that if you were in the east of Ireland, that they could be going to fairs in the west of Ireland, so-called hiring fairs, and picking out men there, and getting them to come across into the east to do the, the seasonal work like all the cultivation, the sowing of the crops, and then have them come back in the autumn to cut the crop, uh, stook it, cart it in, and maybe be involved in thrashing it as well. And one man who did a lot of seasonal farm work in his day was former travelling farm labourer John Dwyer. He had these words of praise for his fellow farm labourers. The farm labourers, they were like the miners in Wales. If you were on the road and you were after finishing with a farmer and you were looking out for another job, you'd have a chat with them. The last thing they'd always say to you before you head off, are you all right, John? Have you something to get food? If they had only two shillings, they'd give you one. And they'd say, there's a shop two mile down the road, John, at the crossroads. Get something to eat in there. And if they knew a farmer was looking for a man, they'd give you his name straight away. They'd always try to help you. And in the winter, then, if you couldn't get work, you went to the local guard station and got a ticket for the county home. You worked your way in the county home. The nuns ran them. Now they're called nursing homes. Posh places. <laughs> you pay well to stop in them. The farming, that was the happiest time. I enjoyed farming. I met all types of characters on the road. And the one thing about that type of life Walking off the side of the road, they never bothered asking you for a reference or anything. They didn't care if you came from hell. Their motto was, the chap is willing to work. in the story. So just how were seasonal or part-time labourers paid? Colm Flynn. It was all on task. He got paid on task. Task was the word used to describe where you come in, kind of like we consider it on contract. But that time you were paid on task, it was, you would strike a rate for a drill a beat, one drill, uh, say a halfpenny. So if you hold a hundred drills tonight, 
that was grand. You do another hundred tomorrow, whatever. You were paid on task. And that's the way it worked for farm yeah, task labor, was seasonal work. farm yeah, labor. Seasonal farm, yeah, they were paid on task. Task would have been, what is the task in hand? The task in hand is hoe the beat, right? So you were paid on task. The task in hand was shear the sheep, some money sheep a day. You know, and you had 200 or 300 or 400 sheep this year. It might take you five days, six days, whatever. You know, but the task. So you were paid on task. And as if you hadn't worked hard enough from eight to six. Most people in the summertime when it was busy would have went home at six o'clock, had some to eat. And gone on and worked on task for maybe another four hours that evening afterwards on another farm. Where to make a bit extra. To make extra, where maybe a farm up the road had 20 acres of potatoes or 20 acres of beef or 20 acres of turnips to be hone. There was hours was finished. The guys would say, right, go home, get something to eat, and they'd go up the road and work on task on another farm and pick up that money. That money would have been there. That The farmer would pay them for whatever work they did in the evening. However... For many farm labourers, the best and most stable situation was to get work for as long as possible. In the 1960s, John Dwyer did just that. One couple, it was the farm I gave the longest term on, ten years, Mr and Mrs Pierce, just outside Trelly near Bally Seedy Castle, up the road from Bally Seedy Castle. They had four little children and I gave ten years there. He got cancer and he passed away and it's kind of the usual story. The children weren't interested in the farm and from what I heard after it was sold off in lots and there's holiday homes now and different things gone up there. And so I headed down to Feenet then, a man called Sean Parker, Mr and Mrs Parker. He had a farm on the mainland and the island. He was a native of the island. So he asked me would I look after the livestock and the tillage on the island. I says no problem. Lived on the island for three years. Just on your own? You actually lived on on the island and taking care of the animals? Looked after the animals and the tillage. He grew sugar beet, potatoes, carrots, massive carrots, pure sand you see. Massive. Very nice, very nice couple. Very nice couple. I used to go back to the mainland some days and give a hand on the main farm on the mainland. And farm labourer John Dwyer spent about three years working for the park as a finnet, after which he moved on to work for other farmers. Now, while most labourers worked for Irish farmers, there were others who got work outside Ireland. Historian Austin O'Sullivan. Many Irish labourers would cultivate their own bit of ground and then they might take off for Scotland. And the young girls would often go as well as young men. And they would come home then and do a bit of farm work. They could go to Scotland again for the sowing time. Maybe the, 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 the so-called tatty hawkers, as they're called, the yes, potato gatherers. Yes. And some of those would actually stay on in Scotland and they would gradually move southwards. Or no, they would actually go down south and because the harvest came in earlier in the south, the, the drier climate, and they gradually worked their way back up to Scotland, and then by around Christmas time, all that harvest work would be fully finished, and they'd come back to Ireland, and there they'd stay at home until the following spring. So that was a whole industry, you might say, that families were subsisting on all down the west coast. And uh, there was a relatively modest level of comfort arising from that. But in the Midlands then in the East, you had a a different situation. As I say, you had a bit of movement of labourers from the West to the East. And of course, these labourers would walk to their work. And we have to remember that. And even those many of those workers who went across to Scotland, they might arrive in Liverpool, but they could spend a week walking to whatever county in up in Aberdeenshire or wherever they were going to the areas where there was thriving farming. And staying for the moment with a topic of walking, here's former travelling farm labourer John Dwyer to share some of his experiences. 
Rovers. The longest walk I ever done, sure, was from Belfast down to Kerry. I'm not joking you. My God, Belfast. I finished with a farmer. How many, how many days did it take you? A fortnight, but I, I took my time. I was in no rush. It's not too bad, a fortnight. I snared, I snared rabbits and I might be lucky to come across a field of potatoes and pull a stalk or two. So you'd actually you pulled the potato out oh, of the field yeah. and you'd eat it raw? Oh no, cook them. Cook, how would you cook it now on the, as you're travelling down through the country? Flintstones or glass. Get heather and glass, the sun shining and you have your fire. Ordinary glass. Doesn't have to be magnifying glass. And this would be now in the Irish weather, John. Yeah. Even in the yeah. depth, depths of winter you'd That's have right. enough sun to get the spark which oh, would start the fire. It. Yeah, and Flintstone. Yeah. I done that hundreds of times. I remember one day, sure, I had a, a rabbit cooking. And the, the nearest farm was a good... I could see it all right, but it was a good while, good bit away. And helped myself to potatoes and cabbage. And the next thing, this fella came up behind me and... He guessed who I was. He says, Geez, John, you could smell that ten mile away. You wouldn't get that in the Gresham Hotel. So just how extensive and varied was the work which most farm labourers did in the old days? Historian Mario Corrigan. It's everything. That's that's what we find hard to believe. I mean, today we kind of have specialised jobs for everything. People, you know, have a, a, all little pigeonholed or whatever. But I mean, the farm labourer was really at the at the whim of the of the stronger farmer of, of the employer, and everything that had to be done on the farm was done by those labourers. And that, of course, the obvious things of reaping and sowing and gathering and and um, milking and and so on. And as we rightly think, there are no holidays. You know, I mean, we we know of people who actually do get married on that morning and they're they're back to work. There's definitely the next day. I mean, you, if people went on a, on a honeymoon that day, it might have been to Dublin, but more than likely they went, they got married, and they they were back to work certainly the next morning. But and that could be both of the couple because everybody had to produce. You know, uh, we're very well aware that sometimes even in the census in 1901, 1911 were sometimes missing children, we're, we're looking for them. And, and you find that once it comes to 13, people are working and they may be working, they may be living with their grandparents. It was a way of holding on to the land, but it was also a way of one less mouth maybe to feed at the home table and a way of helping out grandparents and that as well. But I mean, literally, I mean, if the houses, if the sheds had to be painted or whitewashed or uh, had to be roofed, if the, ga- the fences, the gates, everything had to be, this was the job of the labourer. I mean, it was literally everything. Hard, tough, long, long hours. You had the different seasons. You see, you had the hay. The spring get the crops down, close fields for the hay, and then you had the coming in, the hay was done, the summer was over, well, the turnips, the mangles, the sugar beet, the potatoes, all these things. You were always, you always had something to do. And in those days, the cows were tied in in the winter. They had to be cleaned out, they had to be fed seven days a week. So you were never bored. You were never fed up. And a lot of farms kept two or three pigs. Some of them even kept ten, twenty. It was a handy income. And the eggs. Every farmer's wife or daughter made a few bob out of the eggs to the local shop. John Dwyer. Here's Colm Flynn to discuss some of the variety of farm work from spring into summer. With the beet, the beet came up, it had to be tinned, the beet had to be hoed, the drills had to be moulded up, you were growing potatoes, you were growing turnips, you were growing mangles, you were into making hay, you had, had, meadows had to be mown, meadows had to be turned, the hay had to be dried out, then all the hay had to be kind of gathered in into heaps and the hay saved into cocks. 
Coxton subsequently would have had to be dressed maybe a week or ten days after the um, and cap tied down to stop the wind blowing the tops off them. Similarly, at the same time, sheep had to be shorn, you know, in the month of May. So that was all hand work, hand shears, basically like a glorified scissors. Shear all the wool off the sheep. It had to be rolled. Labour intensive. Yeah, you're getting the picture of labour. Yeah. Yeah, and it's people, 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 because there's no mechanisation. No, there's no, there's no. You're not talking about electricity. Forget about electricity or 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 or, or, um, like that. Diesel power. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you had steam engines, right? They were big steam engines for thrashing. You know, that's the big job. Perhaps the happiest period of farm work on most farms in Ireland in the old days, pre-1950s, was harvest time and the trashing. After the corn was harvested by a reaper and binder, it was eventually thrashed in a thrashing machine powered by a steam engine. Thrashing was the process of separating the loosened chaff from the grain. I met up with thrashing enthusiast Aidan Rochford at the recent White Church Steam and Vintage Working Rally in County Wexford. The combine done away with the trasher, there was less manpower. When you were trashing years ago, you always had to have 10 to 15 with a mill between feeding people on the straw, people on the sacks, and usually a chap always got the job for the chaff because it was a dirty job. Whereas the combine today, one man can operate, and if you have a trailer in the field, he can cut a field and in and out in a couple of hours but not so much that time because they had not only the trasher plus you had to have a steam engine and to fire up an engine it takes about an hour and a half you have to have a full of water you have to have coal so yes there was a lot of manpower involved that time compared to today Absolutely, and when you're looking at, we're just looking at here now your own ransoms trasher from the last of, of the ransoms that make that was made in the early 1950s. And when when you look at it, like I mean, God, there's a good few guys. I mean, in, in the involved in the operation here here at the vintage rally here today in Church, White Church. There is. I mean, yes. so this is really labour intensive. Oh, labour intensive. Yes, which which would be a problem today because you haven't that volume of labour to give you a hand. However. Up to the mid-20th century, getting labour wasn't a problem for most farmers. Thrashing enthusiast Eddie Fox. Everybody helped out. In other words, if there were 10 or 12 farmers in an area, each farmer would go to the other farmer's place on the day of the thrashing and help out. So people didn't have to employ a lot of people because neighbours helped each other. People then weren't very neighbourly. They helped one another. They were very good to one another. Former farm labourer Mick O'Brien. Here's Aidan Rochford once again. Help was very plentiful that time. And, like, even though there was no money there, like, you could have a man down the road and he could have maybe a half an acre of corn and maybe he had a young family and that was his whole income for the year. So it was in his interest to help the bigger farmer, help him at a trashing, and when it come to do his little bit, he had plenty of help to do his. So what exactly did the process of trashing entail? Trashing enthusiast Tom Doherty. The corn was cut into shaves in the field with probably a horse-drawn reaper and binder, brought in then into the farmyard, into the barn, and then the steam engine and the thrashing mill came along to separate the straw from the, from the grain. That probably happened maybe around November or December, like. The corn would have been cut in August, September. It happened over the winter, like. Right, OK, and it would have been a kind of a big communal tradition, am I oh, right? Yes. Yeah, it was kind yes. of all the neighbours. Yeah, all the neighbours, everybody came to help out. It was a big, big thing, like. There was usually a dance and a session then after. <laughs> right, an old dream yeah. to celebrate the activities. Yeah. Oh, yes. A big uh, kind of a, a banquet and a a barrel of beer and a pig like was killed, you know. <laughs> the day of the trashing was quite an event in every farm. And of course the farm women usually hired in extra staff. Maybe it could have been some of the farm workers' wives that come in. Historian Austin O'Sullivan. But anyway, it would be all systems go um, for this 
dinner that the men would be brought into because they'd start work about 8 o'clock in the morning and by around 12 o'clock they'd be mighty hungry. Now they would have maybe got a couple of bottles of Guinness maybe around 11 o'clock to just keep them going but anyway they sit down and there was fairly typically bacon and cabbage and floury potatoes and maybe a big bread pudding or a big dessert after it or possibly a soup of course too because soup was very widely because you could make soup out of all sorts of different things there was plenty of help plenty as I said bacon and cabbage again and an odd pint drink or bottle and then uh, you had the trash and dance and the house dance Mick O'Brien and so the kitchens that time weren't much bigger than what we're sitting in here now. <laughs> oh, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're in a place where we're about maybe 10 metres by 10 metres. Yeah, and the kitchens, and then there was a big table that had been taken out, and the dance hall sits all night. And some fellow with a card in then in the corner, and he'd get drunk when they had finished the dance. The trashing started in September, and trashing machines weren't very plentiful, and it started in September, and it went on until March nearly until the sown of the harvest again, you know. And that went on and on and on and on and on and on all through Christmas and the whole lot. In the dark, cold winter evenings, you know, very cold winter evenings went on. But again, it was, it was hard labour, good fun, and, uh, you know, a dirty job, but it was good fun. And while every farm labourer loved the thrashing dance and the hijink shenanigans that went with it, the raw reality was that most farm work was tough and arduous, with some job tasks worse than others. John Dwyer. The worst job, I think everyone hated, was picking stones. A lot of people don't know it. Stones grow. They don't just fall. They don't fall from the sky. They're shoved up from the crust of the earth. You could clean a field of stones. Perfect. And come back in a fortnight. Sometimes in a week. And don't don't look at it for a week or a fortnight. And look over the ditch. You'd say to yourself, Jeez, the bloody neighbours must have fired them in. <laughs> Somebody is out to get me. They come up from the crust of the earth. The earth is alive. An awful lot of people don't realise that. Pulling beet, and I think most farm labourers would certainly have welcomed the arrival of a beet harvester because that was probably the grimmest work a farm labourer could be put doing where they had to manually pull the beet out of the ground and it had a very long root and having pulled it out they had to sort of scrape the mud off it and then crown it as they call it where you cut off the leaves on the top and you stack those root parts then in piles along the field and then you had to come back along with your horse and cart and fork them onto the cart and bring them up to a point where the sugar company lorry would appear and you might have to help in turn to fork them onto the lorry. So it was heavy manual work right along. But that was probably the extreme. Historian Austin O'Sullivan. Here's former farm labourer Mick O'Brien to share his experiences of what farm jobs he found most challenging. The toughest work now in the farming was, first of all, when the hay, hay season would come in and they'd cock up the hay and then it pull the butts around the bottom of the cock. Now this was to keep the water from going into the cock and then they put a string across it. But pulling the butts of the cock's hay at that time, there'd be tissues. Well, there'd be tissues now, a big tissues of thorns in your hands. Now the next thing was tough in it was the tin of the beet and the tin of the turnips and the tin of the mangel. Now, when you say tinning, what do you mean? Just explain to our listeners who wouldn't uh, be from a, a rural background. Right, I explained to the listeners. You got a, a knee sack, what they call it, an old sack, and you tied it above your knee, and you tied it below your knee. And that 
saved your knee from the in the clay like and you put on your two knees and then after a while you get sweaty and your knees start to get sore but there was no redemption you had to go again the next day maybe a bit of cotton wool would be given to you and when you say thinning you'd be literally kind of thinning out the, the crop that would be <coughs> going to you be harvested so they speak. were sore that time in a, a, a there wasn't like the vision source that's going now like they were sored fully up along and they were thick now they had to be singled out and they were left about six inches apart and you had to do all that when you were thinning and you'd be down and, and weather, often weather was like this now the sun would be bearing down on top of you and the ground would be hard and some farmers would have it done right and I often earn met with good money thinning beet and thinning, thinning turnips and thinning stuff you know and go out and make money as I say I earned it everywhere I did earn it everywhere like Oh my God, absolutely. I, you know, but it was tough work. I mean, blisters on the f- uh, knees, and you know, I mean, and you're working long. I mean, physically exhausting. Yeah, and hangnails on your on your knee. The, the, the hangnails just come up over your nails there, you know. But you got so used to the thistles, you'd go in, you'd ruin under the clay to catch the bow of the thistle, the way it wouldn't catch you, you know. I got over tough times, and but then uh, young lads didn't mind at that time. Young lads wanted a few bob and. Did five or six miles. I often done it in the evenings after work. Did ya? And go out and you take an acre of beet and you, you tin it and bring a couple of things with you and we tin it for, for hourly and you get paid. Be extra few bob. Absolutely. And it was just everyone was doing it. No one knew any different no. and it was the way it was done. It was just a more raw life. Raw life, yeah. It was the way it was done and that was it. There was no other way of doing it. Like. And then they had these holes, they used to gap them sometimes for you, you know, that hole to be. But still, they had to be done on the knees. Everything was manually done that time. Everything. Back a long way down under the 50s now, all that was manually done. But men were fit, and they lived to be a ripe old age. Historical and social archives record that conditions for many farm labourers were often very harsh. In particular, those labourers hired by farmers on a part-time basis. Many such labourers endured hard physical labour, low wages and much maltreatment. Historian Austin O'Sullivan of the Irish Agricultural Museum in Johnstown Tassel Estate, County Wexford. We will hear regularly about these hiring fairs, but that was just a matter of a day or two at a particular location but it was what would happen to that person when they got to the actual farm it would so much depend on the attitude and the generosity of the employer and it's sad to say many of the employers many of the worst employers were often the native irish farmers who were seeking to absolutely maximise their profit. To some degree, they were trying to mimic what was happening in the big houses, but with a fraction of the staff. And the treatment of their indoor staff and outdoor staff would leave a lot to be desired. And, you know, I wouldn't like to go too much into the treatment and maltreatment. At its best, it might take the form of being actually... A prov- that there could be a so-called building out in the farmyard that would be euphemistically called the lodge and that might be a little building unheated it might have a, a fireplace in it all right but very rudimentary facility where the farm workers were meant to live overnight and sort of survive the better farmers would have the farm workers in now they mightn't eat with the family but they would certainly be well fed in the kitchen nearby or the so on but it could, as I say, vary from treating the labourers almost as, you know, a disposable item to be very caring about the men themselves, but of their wives and of their children. You know, for every good guy that was out there, there were ruthless, selfish people. I've spoken to guys who worked on farms, who, you know, and I remember one guy commenting one day that the dish coming out to the dog at the back of the house had more food in it for the dog from the kitchen table than he had 
at his disposal where he was outside in uh, you know and he was actually watching the, the dog getting a better feed than he had South County Kildare farmer Colm Flynn who himself worked for a while as a farm labourer in his youth here's former farm labourer Mick O'Brien the farm labourers were treated good and bad if I was to say good I would be telling a lie as I said before I was treated very well but there was other men that worked hard and they were they got the cold shoulder you know but you see, farmers at that time were independent. Labour was cheap and there was plenty of men out, out there. So there was a man for everything. Working conditions and wages for farm labour sometimes became so bad that they had no choice but to unite and go on strike. Historian Mario Corrigan of Kildare Library Services. The farm labourers went on strike in 1946. There apparently had been an embargo on, on wages, so that they, in, very much to keep the strikes, uh, you know, strikes were not going to happen. Um, and that was lifted, once that embargo was lifted, it opened the door um, for quite a few different groups to express their hopes, um, including the teachers, but most notably and forgotten forgotten into history, the farm labourers strike of 1946, which of course would have hit the backbone of, of the Irish economy and a population, huge rural population, even in places like Kildare, which are on the, the, the doorstep of Dublin. And very difficult for, for the families at the time and resulted, uh, sadly, I, I suppose, in terms of uh, again, a, a victory in some respects for the employer and for the stronger farmers, but strangely, bad weather and uh, wages actually did rise a little. But it would have been a time of great difficulty for the majority of people involved in the strike. The farm labourers were really at the bottom of the pile. They were paid low wage and their conditions were very unstable. They were locked out of education. They were locked out of accumulation of land because of the lack of education. They couldn't progress past menial work. You know, it's not until free education comes in at the end of the 1960s that you have big inroads into this in terms of opening up greater access. So in the early 20th century, the farm labourers are really at the bottom of the pile. And I heard an anecdote from County Tipperary, which I think illustrates this. So in this place in County Tipperary, when someone was sick, there was a local doctor. And you might send for him in the middle of the night. And he used to come round and he used to knock on the door. And he'd say, are you farmers? This means, you know, do you own land? Because, you know, often a, a labourer might own a little bit. But are, are you farmers? And, and if they say no, it says, no, I can't help you. So it, the farm labourers are, are really, you know, they're locked out of the most basic of services. Historian John Dorney. However, while farm labourers might have been locked out, nevertheless, this didn't stop many of them from helping others who cross their path in life. Former travelling farm labourer John Dwyer. Many a married farm labour. I pass in their little cottage with six and seven children and I begun to pass the gate. Little girl or little boy come running after me and say, Mister, my mammy says, will you come in and have something to eat? Give me more than I could eat. And they wouldn't need a wheelbarrow to bring home the wages. Do you know what I'm getting at? Absolutely. I often went to a big house Look for a cup of tea and a cut of bread. They nearly take that fingers off you slamming the door. John, I'd say when you're on the road, I'd say you really, you know, in a very graphic manner, yeah. realise who your friends are. That's true. Would I be right? You're quite right. And it was the people, the working people. Like I said, the married farm labour trying to scrape a living was the one that gave you most to eat. Many a farm labour's house I went into and I'd be after eating and I'd say to him, I'd head off now. They'd say, hang on, one of my sons is after growing out of clothes. Go upstairs and have a wash. And just, lovely clothes. The boy would be only 15 or 16, taller than me. And 
It's, uh, his clothes will fit you perfect. I come down like a banker. And staying for the moment with the topic of farm labour families in days gone by, given the social moors of Ireland up to the mid 20th century. Such families were nearly always very large. Mario Corrigan. If you were lucky enough to have a labourer's cottage that was actually provided for you, what that might mean would be, you know, two rooms. One room where you had lived and you did the cooking and whatever, and the other room was a bedroom, and you might have the parents separated from the children with some sort of curtain or something that was drawn across. And you could have as many as, as you know, 10 to 14 to 16 in a family. And everything had to be worked out of that half acre. Whatever people could get, you know, and people held on to, you know, if you could have a pig, and most people did, you ha- and you would sell off the little piglets, or, or you could have chickens, provide your, you, you'd grow vegetables, you know. And I mean, everything you could do was a, a, a way of actually creating a better lifestyle for yourself. But it was really tough. And maybe after working 10 hours or 12 hour days on the farms, people were coming home and tending to their own gardens and that, you know. You didn't have these marvellous holidays and time to to recuperate and time to get your your affairs in order I mean every day was living onto that edge and I mean there was very little extra money and the person often best skilled at bringing extra money was the farm labouring woman many of them worked long hours in the fields to try make ends meet and secure their family's future Mick O'Brien women labourers at that time were treated women weren't treated as they should be you know, they weren't treated. They were treated, uh, I don't know, I, just, I can't find words to explain it, but they were, they were treated uh, badly in a lot of places. And all over uh, the county of Wexford in Ireland, everywhere they were treated. They weren't treated like they are now, like, you know what I mean? You know, women, aren't just women, they've got hardship now. And they come out in the fields then with the with the, with the, with the plasking, they used to call it, and they're, they're picking the spuds in the big basket, and they're there picking the spuds, and then go home and make the dinner. There were some children in Ireland, I know families in Ireland, were reared be decided to ditch and give them a bottle when, when, when they'd be picking the spuds to bring the children to the, to, to, to the field with them. This would be the far, for women, farm labour women, farm and they'd go out and they'd be uh, yeah. working, and they'd have the baby on they the would, side. Yeah, they'd have the baby on the headland. And the cup every now and again. And, and you saw that with your own eyes? I did, yeah. Back in the 50s? Back, back way back down the 50s, yeah. Oh God, I did, yeah. I know one woman, I'm not going to mention her name, she didn't go now. And she used to be tinning beet and tinning turnips. And she was pregnant a lot of the time, rare to be family. And them children used to go to school. And they'd meet her, she'd bring sandwiches with them, and they'd, she'd get them to give her a hand in the evening, they're going home from school. And uh, as they say, a slice of bread, two slices of bread and a bit of jam. That's a fight. My God, wow, it's unbelievable, isn't it? You know, you it's, know hard to, it's hard It is hard today to believe that the country we have now and the country we had then, you know, it's hard to believe. And people, people, you know, a sewer close. Uh, very seldom you had a sewer close, you know. Uh, it's just hard going, it's hard going. Everything was tough. But the women that worked around on, on the land, in big houses, milked the cows, done all the necessary jobs, looked after the children. Former travelling farm labourer John Dwyer. They all worked, even the farmer's wife worked very hard. If she had to get paid today for the work she done back then, 500 euro a week wouldn't make up for it. Yes. Milk the cows, feed the pigs, feed the calves, do all the housework, look after the children, you name it, everything. And it wasn't just one or two kids, it was a, a, the normal family size That's would have right. been maybe six, seven six, upwards. Seven. Yeah. Probably even some families, 14 or, or thereabouts. One farmer I worked with, Tom Rafferty, 15 children.
Following the end of the First World War in 1918, tractors began to slowly appear on farms throughout the world. Now, following the end of the Second World War in 1945, tractors and farm machinery had progressed so much that the days of countless farm labourers working the land were numbered. Historian Austin O'Sullivan of the Irish Agricultural Museum. The internal combustion engine tractor, really, which totally altered the scene all across Europe. And um, we were fairly, relatively early into mechanisation in Ireland because, of course, we were up against the British mainland there, which was mechanising rapidly. And, of course, what happened in England yesterday happened with, in Ireland the day after. The Ferguson tractor, really, and the hydraulic system for, of ploughing, that done away with the horses. The three-point linkage. Three-point linkage, all that system, that probably done away with the horses as well. Then the tractors advanced a bit further, then they went for diesel engines as well, so they ran better, easier to keep them going. And then we're into four-wheel drives after yeah. that. Yeah, four-wheel drives, all that then. Computers now. Thrashing enthusiast Tom Doherty. Here's Dennis Mullally. But after the war, fuel got easier to get. And, and the diesel engine and the, so on. The diesel engine was the big thing. Three-point linkage yeah, into tractors. That, yeah. My father bought a, a Nuffield Perkins diesel in 1953. It was the first diesel that came around our part of the country. Everyone, what part of the country was that? Ross Gray, North Oh, Ross Gray, North and everyone said he was mad to buy a diesel engine. Nobody had a diesel engine at that time. And now they're power the core. Everyone has their norm. Yeah. So that was the sort of the finish of the the horses and the steam. Right. And so me- mechanise it, mass modern mechanisation from, from there on, on in, and really the kind of the death knell of the farm labour law as well. Oh right. yeah, sir. Sure. When the sectors and the machinery came, naturally they were doing the work and. One man with a tractor and a lot of equipment could do the work of ten men with horses previous to that. You might say from the sickle to the combine happened in the 50 years from 1900 to 1950 and all was changed thereafter. Big machinery, that was the death knell of it. Tractors start getting real plentiful. Machinery. I don't know if you'll find a farm without a tractor. Mechanisation was actually taking over. What you're seeing is that, you know, a disappearance like of a whole class of people. And they're just no longer necessary after mechanisation. The whole system of producing food went from being entirely the work of a labourer, of a manual worker, to be work done with the aid of a machine. But are we going to be able to have the fuel to continue all this mechanised agriculture? It's very doubtful. We may well be returning to refined forms of manual labour because oil is a limited resource we keep being told it's going to dry up in 10 years, 20 years, but certainly it's, it's a finite resource and farming will be very different in the times of our next generation than it is now. I think there will be a, a whole new world out there that we should be thinking about and we shouldn't be wasting our fossil fuels Over the last while we've heard former farm labourers, historians and various social commentators discuss the old farm labouring tradition which dominated Irish agriculture up until the mid-20th century. Until modern farm machinery and mechanisation did away with the need for them. So what is the ultimate legacy of the farm labourers of yesteryear? Mick O'Brien Good men worked on farms and very hard men worked on farms. I know we had our, our people that died for this country and uh, young lads that died for this country. And, of course, I suppose they got history more than the ordinary labour man. But the labour man nearly died for this country too. 
I can tell you now, and I'm telling you now, like, he, he, he nearly died for this country too. He worked hard and made this country the one it is. I'd be interested in the songs about Kevin Barry and Kevin Barry and those young lads. They were, they were, they were good lads now. They, you know, you can't knock them. But uh, down in the farmer's field, there was every bit as good a lads. And uh, the, it goes back to the history of the Battle of Ross back in 1798 when, when they fought the battle in Ross. And the farm labour, they just called on him and said, come on, we have to fight the battle. And they went with a slash oak or a pike or whatever they had. Out of the fields, with their shirt and trousers, and was killed in there, and died for Ireland. Now, what about them? Without the men willing to do the long hours, and the women even to do longer hours, you know, that those families would have not been able to survive, you know. And I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. Historian Mario Corrigan of Kildare Library Services. These people who are largely forgotten by history, these farm labourers, but we don't give them the credit that they actually deserve in history in terms of these were the people who got things done. These were the things that made it possible for the foods and so on to be delivered to the table, but also that eventually, even if they moved into the towns and left that life behind them, that these were the ones that actually did improve their lot. These were the people who sweated and toiled in the fields of Ireland over centuries. Sure, they fed the country, really. Kept food going for the country, all the crops. They were the, the, ma- the main cog in the wheel the farm labourers. So without them, the harvest would not be saved. And then the country would go hungry. But the wheat, you know, that was most vital for the economy of the country too. When it comes down to it, these are the people who, who produced the food and who produced the wealth. And had it not been for them, the place couldn't have functioned for, for all those centuries. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.